Five for five, first ever five for five in the history of Resonate Church. And I want to say, this, this isn't gimmick for us. This isn't like, you know, I want a Sunday off. This is important. And this speaks to the culture of our house. Here's what I want us to really get. I mean, you're going to hear from God and you're going to hear from these people. But here's something I want you to really understand this morning. You can hear from God. And you might not always have a microphone in your hand, but your life is the only message someone's getting in your world. And so we're gonna put a microphone in the hand of five of our leaders. I love that the bench is a little bit too small. That's just how we do it around here. <laughs> uh, we're gonna put a microphone in the hands of these leaders, but you need to know these guys are already communicating. They're communicating with our leaders. They're communicating with our teams. They're communicating with you. So this is not the only time they communicate, but we just believe that what they already communicate, that there's a word of God in their hearts and they're going to speak to you today. I'm just honored that they're going to share. And so here's what we need to do. Here's the ground rules for 5 for 5 Sunday. First of all, you need to be loud. If you think being loud in church is disrespectful, I think the opposite is true. How could we be quiet in an atmosphere where we're learning about the relentless love of God? In fact, I think silence is disrespectful in the house of God. <laughs> so we're all for standing ovations. Look, like, throw them off. Like, they're going to be, you know, they're timed to five minutes. If you gave someone a standing ovation in the middle of what they said because it was just that good, they're going to be like, what do I cut? What do I cut? You're just going to throw them right off. Just go for it. Let's do it. Let's be loud. Uh, let's be loud. That's why we have hearing protection at guest services. Let's be loud. Uh, uh, secondly, just open your hearts to receive from God. Open your hearts because God is going to speak through these guys. We're so excited. Everyone's got five minutes. They're going to have a, a little bumper video before everyone to introduce you to them if you don't know them. I'm not going to introduce them. They're going to introduce themselves when they get up here. Uh, so why don't we do this? Why don't you go ahead and give an unbelievable round of applause for our first speaker this morning, Jamala <laughs> Maya. Good morning, church. My name is Jamal Amaya. I am the director of Resonate Kids, and I'm honored to lead our incredible Resonate Kids dream team. I'm grateful to stand in front of all of you to share my story. Not gonna lie, the last time I stood in front of a crowd this big, I threw up. So, <laughs> front row, watch out. <laughs> of course, I was 10 years old at the time, and it's been 13 years since, so let's just say I'm finally facing my fears. <laughs> in 2 Samuel chapter 22, there are some words of King David that are a picture of the journey God has taken me on. David says, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out from deep waters. I became a Christian in the toughest season of my life. I was in a dark place, experiencing tremendous amounts of self-hatred. I was so far from God, and the enemy was pushing me farther from him every day. Somehow, I felt like I had nothing left. I honestly felt like I had nowhere to turn. A friend directed me towards God, and when she prayed for me, I felt peace. God began a process of healing in me in that moment and put me on a path where what he's done in me and who I am could be used for his glory. That friend, she said to me, Jamala, to heal properly, you're going to have to go to the space you were running from. You're going to have to go to the fear that you were running from. So after months of pushing it away, I went on my knees and I went to the words and the situations that I had packed away. I went to the times where the world stepped on me and I had to remind myself of my pain. And every time I did, something in me changed because Jesus, he was covering it, he was restoring it, he was redeeming it because he promised me he would. What I felt was similar to what David says here in 2 Samuel. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out from deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes, who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out in a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. 
He enabled me to be fueled with passion, not to walk back to a life of pain, but to walk to a life of purpose. What passion does, it fuels you past your fears in order to fulfill the purpose of what God has given you. God's promises, he doesn't just put them in our way. We don't just all of a sudden have them. We don't just stumble over them. But he's going to put them in our reach, and we have to reach for them. And sometimes we don't take the time to look for those promises. There are so many promises in the Bible, 3,000. That's a big number. And I don't know them all, but I want to seek them because I want to know. Because when I go into the darkness, which I know I will in this life, God promises he's going to protect me. He promises me he's going to give me peace beyond all understanding. God promises me he's going to love me and carry me whenever I go there first. God isn't waiting for us to get wiser or healthier or smarter. He already has the plan worked out. There are times in scripture where David calls out to God in a place of save me. But in this scripture, he's looking at it from a place of deliverance, having seen God save him. In a place of relationship he already had with the Lord way before this moment. David knew the character of God. He calls God all of these names that are so intentional. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He is my shelf and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, my strength. He will reach down and draw me from the fires. He drew me out because my God takes delight in me. And I've seen it for all these years. So David believed because he was coming from a place that he had seen so. I believe God has the ability to instantly heal me and cover me completely. But I have to go there to get it and ask him to receive it. And anytime I talk about the bad parts, the scary parts, I won't be talking about it from a place of pain, but rather from a place of purpose, rooted in the passion that God has instilled in me. To change the world and to make a difference in the world around me. I have passion rooted in my purpose. So if we want to walk through our lives and deliver his promises, then we have to go. And we have to receive. And we want to get our spiritual preparation ready and rooted. You know I love you, church, and I'm saying this with all the love in my heart. Are you going to Jesus? What I've got from God, I'm going to give. I say this to say, Jesus redeems all that is broken and makes it beautiful again. Good morning, church. So good to see you all here this morning. My name's Jane. I oversee our Resonate groups and Connections team and prayer team. And this morning, the passage of scripture I want to talk to you from is from Matthew 14. It's part of the story where Jesus sends the disciples out across the lake in a boat. And during the night, about three o'clock in the morning, the storm picks up. And the disciples start to panic. And then Jesus walks towards them on the water. So we're going to pick up in verse 28 to 33. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And I'm pretty sure this is a really accurate account that Jesus went, sure, mate, it's all good, come on out. (laughs) I'm sure of it. So Peter climbs out over the boat, starts walking towards Jesus in the water. But then he sees the waves, he feels the wind, He hears the storm and he's terrified and he starts to sink. And he calls out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reaches out for him and grabs his hand and says, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Then when they got back in the boat, the storm calmed down and the disciples worshipped God saying, you really are the son of God. I want to tell you a little bit about my own boat, my own storm in the past few years. A couple of years ago, as a family, we decided to move from Brisbane to Canada, hearing God's call on our lives. We left family, we left church, jobs, we left security. We said yes to God's call, and in doing that, we became unhinged from the comfortable, the known, the security, the control, a little bit of a control freak, and the clarity. (laughs) Have you ever felt the stress of one challenge after the other, the weight of the decisions 
and the distractions from what God has for your life or the peace. Just because we decided to heed God's call didn't mean it was easy. There were so many difficulties and challenges after making that decision. So my first point here is from verse 29, and it's about stepping out. In this storm with the disciples, Jesus didn't give them the how to do this list. It wasn't like the dummy's guide to surviving the storm. I, I really could have used that, like, you know, Jane, do this, step one. Jane, do this, step two. But he didn't do that. He didn't give that to the disciples. What he said is, step out. We can only conclude by this account of Matthew that Jesus knows we learn so much better by experiencing him in our circumstance, not because we're just told. So Jesus allowed the disciples to experience the storm and he's allowed me to experience my storm and maybe he's allowing you to experience your storm. And it's because it deepens my faith. It deepens my knowledge and understanding of him and who he is as master and commander of my life. My second point is from verse 30. What do you see? By now we know Jesus came to the disciples. Peter walks out in the water. But instead of having his eyes fixed on the miracle, he sees the storm. He feels the storm. He's terrified. And I know that I have those moments where all I see is the storm in my life. And I feel terrified. We too often don't see Jesus' presence in the messy situations. We don't recognise he's working in the storm nor his power to battle with it. We're absorbed by our circumstance and we fail to see him in it or through them. Can you see past your circumstance and see Jesus working in your life today? The third point, verse 31, says Jesus makes a comment on faith and fear. So this is the irony. My faith in moving here, the disciples' faith in stepping out, is going to be wildly inadequate for what God can do, for that God possible moment Our best efforts, our strongest moments of faith are when we allow God to do the impossible in our lives. See, faith is messy. It calls us to a hard place within ourselves of learning to let go of control and let him be the master and commander of our faith. How can we allow God's presence in our lives so that we live in this God possible space? space? We reach out, we let go, we trust God. God's present to you in whatever storm you're experiencing today. He loves you. It doesn't have to be calm for you to experience God. He knows what you're going through. He can handle your situation. He's got you. All you have to do is step out. Good morning, Resonate Church. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. My name is Matt. My wife, Brittany, and I have the honor of serving as leaders of the setup team here at Resonate Church. And that leads me to my topic. I'm going to be spending the next five minutes talking about why everyone should join the setup team. (laughs) Just kidding. That's not true. (laughs) I've always loved serving in church and serving other people. God has wired me this way, and I feel the most joyful and connected at church when I'm actively serving in some way. But about a year ago, God challenged me on my motivations for doing things for him. Not that he didn't love what I was doing and the impact he was having on his church, but he forced me to look at my reasons for doing those things. Um, so that, that forced me to, re- I was reading my Bible, approached a passage in Matthew that just stopped me in my tracks. It was from Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Jesus speaking on this, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So this text forced me to ask some really tough questions. Is my future in heaven secure? Will Jesus say to me one day, I never knew you? Feeling discouraged, I went to God in prayer. Lord, is my future in heaven secure? I've done so many things in your name. I've cried out to you. I've built homes for the poor. I've fed the homeless. I've served your church faithfully. And feeling discouraged, 
I just went, I went from that prayer without answers and just feeling the heaviness of that text weigh on me. Why did I list things that I've done for God? Does that have anything to do with my salvation? Were these works really to build up the church or to build up myself in the view of others? As I continued to wrestle with this, I had a realization about the distinction Jesus is making between these two groups of people within the church. Those who do things externally for their, with the wrong motives and those who do of the, the will of the Father and whom Jesus knows. And I realized that I wasn't always pursuing Jesus in the dark when nobody was looking. I was looking, after his, I was looking for his blessing, community, euphoric feelings in worship, approval, but I wasn't always seeking the real prize for, for Jesus to know us and for us to know Jesus. I'm on a journey of pursuing Jesus for who he is and not what he offers. There's been times that I've had difficulty spending time reading the Bible. I was often reading it out of a sense of obligation. And, and it, since God had called me closer to him, I found it easier to spend time reading his word from a place of wanting to know his heart and his amazing story. Serving has also become way more joyous for me. This intentional time with God and in his word has given me a fresh picture of God's heart for those who don't know him. And that's for everyone to discover the fullness of life and freedom that only Christ offers. So back to the text. What Jesus was telling his audience in Matthew 7, is that we might cry out to God and do good works in his name, but that doesn't offer us salvation. This text describes people in this room, people who recognize who Jesus is, are serving his church, or maybe not serving. He's offering us a warning about where our hearts are leading us. We need to ask ourselves which way our lives are leaning. Am I leaning into Jesus and pursuing him for who he is, or am I seeking my own interests? That might be your job, your bank account, your relationships, or what Jesus describes here, doing things that look like they're for God, but they're really for ourselves? Or are you seeking intimacy with your creator and his son, Jesus? For those who are alarmed by what Jesus says in this passage, use it as an opportunity to reflect on your own motives. Jesus has made a way for us, and reflecting on God's love for us and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross will bring us to a place where we realize how vain our own pursuits are and how Jesus demands us to truly lay down our lives to follow him. My name's Natasha. Hi. And I've never been up here, so this is weird. But I am so excited to be here. Today, I'm going to be talking about adventurous expectation. Have you ever expected something only to have the opposite happen? I was in Australia a few months ago, and this was my first ever solo overseas adventure. So I expected to have an epic time. But on the fourth day of my epic adventure, something unexpected happened. I broke my toe. <laughs> Hashtag fail. Just one month before my adventure, I was talking with God on New Year's Eve, and I asked him what I should expect from the New Year. I admitted that I was really discouraged from all of the goals and expectations that were not met the previous year. He led me to this passage in Romans 8, where Paul writes to the new Christians in Rome who did not really know what to expect from this newly accepted faith. The Message Bible puts it in modern English, and this is what it says. This resurrection life you have received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It is adventurously expectant. God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. So what happens when your experiences don't meet your expectations? Because I did not expect it, but here I was 
alone in a strange country, weeping as I limped my way to the hospital, feeling so alone and punched in the gut. Have you ever felt that way? It may not be a toe break. It could be a loss of a job. It could be a loss of a relationship or a loved one. It could even be a bad report from the doctors. In my moment of loss and confusion, I did the one thing I knew I could in that situation. I cried. <laughs> my cry then turned into prayer, and I prayed for wisdom to make my next move, and I prayed for comfort. My story turned around, but a revelation of who the Father is struck me. He is a good father, not a bully. He doesn't like watching you cry for help and not get any. He doesn't sit there and say, I'm going to teach that child a horrible lesson today. He doesn't do that. And I know this because a good father would never do that. It starts with knowing how possessively the father loves you. Like I said earlier, my story turned around. I was now fitted with a moon boot as I hobbled my way out of that hospital feeling all kinds of confident. I learned to wake up in the morning, look at my swollen purple foot, and then look to God and say, okay, Daddy, what do you think we should do today? I soon found that I was on a different adventure. Sometimes things happen that are unexpected, but don't let that stop you from expecting your healing and your breakthrough. Don't stop expecting to see yourself rise up from failure and depression. The Bible teaches us that expectation is not just a feeble hope for something nice and fuzzy. We are, given ex we are given permission to expect an audacious faith, knowing with certainty that all things work together for good to those who love God. I'm thankful we're part of a church where we expect God to move. We expect breakthrough. We expect from our Father who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Our Father meets us right where we are. So be brave. Be brave when things don't go as planned. The Father always turns a hard situation into something beautiful. Know that you can trust him. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Troy. I get the privilege of being the executive pastor here at Resonate Church. Yeah, man, it's so good. I love this place so much. I just want to take a quick moment and actually shout out to Pastor Shane and Rachel quickly for trusting the five of us with a microphone in our hands today. That takes a lot. They are building leaders. They trusted in us. They believed in us along the way. They're cheering us on. So we love you guys. Thank you for this opportunity to share this morning. Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 30. It's a well-known passage in scripture. Jesus is speaking to a large crowd of people, and he says this. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. There that word is again, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What I want to do in the next couple of minutes is unpack what is Jesus offering us here in this text. And it's vastly different from what you and I often think of as rest. See, rest, typically we're thinking it's something in the form of our bodies, right? Like sleep. So a couple months ago, my little princess Adelaide, uh, she's two years old, she got this violent case of the flu. And so being the unselfish great dad that I am, Rachel can attest to this, um, I laid on her floor all night long, catching puke about every 20 to 30 minutes. It was a great night. Needless to say, at 9 a.m. the next morning, I show up to my meeting with this girl right here, Jamala, and I'm sitting across from her, I've had about two hours of sleep, and I am done. And I look at her and I say, Jamala, how are you doing this morning? And she's like, Troy, I'm exhausted. And I'm like, girl, I'm like, I can feel you on that. I'm like, tell me more. And she's like, well, you know what? Fell asleep around 9.30 last night, slept all the way until about right before our meeting, got up, I'm completely exhausted because I overslept. And I'm like, 
Are you kidding me right now? But isn't it funny how that's always the end of that story? That it's always whether we're pursuing more sleep, more vacation time, whether it's more money, more security, maybe it's retirement down the road, it always comes up short. You know, whenever we get more sleep, we're left more tired. And we always need a vacation from our vacation. And whenever we get there, there being more money, or that job we were always expecting, we get there and we find that there's this void still inside of us that hasn't been fulfilled by those things. What if Jesus said the rest that he offered us wasn't contingent on what we have or what we don't have, or the circumstances that we're in right now? Like, I believe Jesus wants for us is he wants peace and he wants joy in our lives, that regardless of our circumstances, that we can feel peace and feel joy. And that's a peace that's unexplainable and a joy that doesn't even make sense. See, the last 12 months for me and my family have been filled with a lot more unrest than rest. And I've never needed this text more than my entire life right now. So we moved our family, change of jobs, change of scenery, city, less income, higher living expenses. I've never felt more in my life like I'm searching for rest in some form of bodily rest. But God, I'm realizing more and more that he doesn't actually want that for me. He's got way bigger plans. And the rest that Jesus offers us is actually here on this earth right now. See, my body's going to die one day. All of us are going to die. And on that day, our bodies will find true rest. But what Jesus is offering us is here is for right now, for today, that we can experience this here on earth. So how do we get this rest that Jesus is talking about? We got to go back to the text here to find it. And Jesus tells us there's one way, the only way. He gives us three simple words. He says, come to me. Come to me. You know, I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know if the weight of the world is on your shoulders or if The weight in your heart is crushing you. I don't know if your pursuit of rest in your own form is crushing you this morning. But what we have here is an invitation from the God of the universe who's saying, come to me and I'll remove guilt. Come to me and I'll remove that weight of shame. Come to me and I'll remove that weight of fear and of sin. Church, life is going to be hard, but I believe that there is purpose in your pain. I believe that there can be peace amidst your pain, and I actually believe there's joy in your pain that's so crazy, it actually gives hope to the people around you who are in their own suffering. Church, my prayer for all of you this morning is that we would all hear a loving God say to us, come to me, and our response would be to move towards him, and in doing so, we'd find true rest for our souls. Thank you. You can be seated this morning. Wow. That was amazing. Hey, I, I don't know what you guys heard. I want to recap just a couple of the thoughts that these guys shared that were just so impactful for me. Jamala talked and she, man, she finished and she said, she said, are you going to Jesus? She looked at, at us as, as, as a church family, and maybe you're visiting with us, and so you're kind of sitting in on, on, on today, and you're not part of our church family yet. Um, but she, she looked at you, and she said, I love you, church. Are you going to Jesus? She talked about how she came to Jesus out of the most difficult period of her life. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, and you showed up, and you did not expect to hear from someone who's never spoken in their life before and have them be the one to say something to you that made you realize, I need Jesus today. And before we close this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to, get, to take a step of faith in the direction of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved, not just, not just forgiven, free. Like where you go from that darkness she talked about and you step into a light, that actually begins to bring, as Troy talked about, real rest for your soul because the stuff that you've been pursuing just hasn't been measuring up. Maybe you're feeling like Jane today and she talked about faith being messy. She said that, you know, we go through storms and maybe you're, going, maybe you're in your storm today. What you needed to hear was how Jane talked about God did not give to Peter that list that says, here's how you get through this. He provided himself 
as a miracle. You know what I love about that text? Is that after Peter falls, he gets, gets wet, he, you know, he goes from walking, he gets his eyes off Jesus, he falls. And then Jesus looks at him, he's like, you have so little faith. And what busts me up about that is Peter is the only person who's ever walked on water. If I would expect Jesus to say to someone, you have so little faith, it would be me. Or maybe it would be you. I've never walked on water. Why did Jesus say to the guy who walked on water, who had more faith than any of us in this room have ever demonstrated, you have so little faith? Why did he call that guy out? To tell us the biggest that you could believe for, your best step of faith is still going to underestimate what he could do. Jesus wasn't wanting to embarrass Peter and say like, you know, you have so little faith, you're a failure. He was wanting Peter to know, you cannot, you cannot overestimate. Your best faith is nowhere near to what I can do. Come on, so word for somebody. You need to begin to believe that God can do that which has seemed utterly impossible in your life. And then there was Maddie. <laughs> wow. Um, conviction right in the middle of the morning. I mean, Maddie just talked about how he was doing stuff for God, but he wasn't close to Jesus. So I wonder where you're at this morning. It was a loving challenge. It was a loving conviction. And sometimes God brings those to our lives. See, God will bring guilt, but he won't bring shame. He will speak to the issues in your life that need to change, but he won't shame you. He doesn't want you to stay stuck. He wants you to move out of that place that you're at. So maybe today you needed a challenge. Maybe today you needed a reminder that it's time to engage with God on a deeper level, whether it's serving in the house or whether it's just getting in your word with God or whether it's some other thing that God would speak to you today. And Natasha and her broken toe. I think that was a word for, for people. She talked about how don't let broken expectations keep you from expecting. So would you bow your heads with me all over the room? See, Jesus can do far more than we can do with our words. He can actually heal your heart. And the presence of God is in this room this morning to speak to your heart. Something we believe in so powerfully around this place is that every, pretty much every single time we gather, we're going to give an opportunity for people to make a decision to follow Jesus. And so if you're here this morning and you're in the room and this wasn't, some, you know, this was really a lot of this was directed to the church, but something someone said today or some revelation of who God is or who Jesus is, you say, you know what, today is my day to make a decision to follow Jesus. I don't want to wait another day. I don't want to wait another week. Today is my day. You'd say, yeah, today I want to become a Christian. I want to be forgiven and I want to know that freedom. Man, I just see something in their lives today on the stage that I know I need and I want. If, if today you'd say, yeah, that's where I'm at today. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I count to three. And raising your hand won't save you. Even just praying a prayer won't save you. It is the faith of your heart that believes God is who he said he is that will save your soul. Believing in Jesus Christ. So if that's you, today you'd say, yep, I, I don't know what they have, but I know I need it in my life. And you'd say, today I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand on the count of three? And know we're not going to embarrass you, center you out. We're just going to pray a prayer together before we close our service. If that's where you're at, would you raise your hand? Say, today's my day. One, two, three. Would you shoot your hand up and say, yeah, pray for me before you dismiss the service? Yeah, man. See your hand and yours as well. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hands all over the room this morning. If you raise your hand, pray this prayer with me. And church, church, would you pray this? Would you help those who are praying this today? Just, just pray this with me. Say, dear Jesus, my life is yours. Totally. I want to go your way. I believe you died and rose again 
so I could be forgiven and free. So help me follow you. I receive your forgiveness. And I receive your freedom and your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Keep our hands together.